the creative mornings. Okay. <laughs> Uh, before we begin, the Victoria Arts Council respectfully acknowledges the Lekwungen speaking people within whose traditional territory we operate. And we give thanks to the Santis, Esquimalt, and Wasanic First Nations, whose historical relationship with this land continues to this day. We raise our hands in gratitude for the ancestors, matriarchs, hereditary leaders, and the artists from these lands. And we give thanks for the privilege of living and working here. My name is Kagan McFadden, and I am the Executive Director of the Victoria Arts Council, and along with Kosar Mahabadi, Mahabadi, <laughs> it's like the third time I've said that name, um, and Laura Dutton, we organize Creative Mornings uh, every month. Uh, so normally it is a morning lecture series, and we're very excited to have my good friend John G. Bome uh, break that tradition, as he is known to do, and uh, we're, we're going into nighttime. So uh, I will pass it over to Kosar, who has a lot of sponsors to thank. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to read some stuff. Welcome to Creative Mornings. <laughs> <laughs> our global theme for December is pain. It was chosen by, by our Vive chapter and illustrated by Marta Kosulinska. <laughs> Ouch, that hurts. <laughs> pain is a warning and a lesson it teaches us what we should avoid and just how much we can bear there's the pleasure of sadomasochism the anguish of emotional trauma or physical abuse the seemingly endless barrage of vitriol in the comments the grief of losing a loved one the immense destruction and psychological toll caused by so many geopolitical conflicts happening around the world our Aviv chapter in Ukraine knows the pain of war, as they wrote when they chose this month's theme, in quotes, our collective pain is now close to unbearable. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We hope whoever said that is right, end quote. Muscles grow stronger after ex exercise, tears the tiny fibers of muscle cells, and the body repairs those damages. We know that physical wounds can heal with time and proper care, but we often ignore the fact that emotional pain can too. If you need a little relief from whatever pain you're carrying, talk to someone, make something, or help someone else in need. Pain can point to the way of growth. And I would like to mention some of our sponsors, the City of Victoria, the CRD, and HCMA, uh, which is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. And as you know, we are from the Victoria Arts Council, in December, we've had our member show, which is a Little Gems uh, exhibition at the Pat Martin Bates Gallery, which is where you are. It's open every day of the week until Thursday. So please uh, visit us. It's open 11 to 5 p.m. And in January, we'll be hosting the exhibition, You Are Welcome, which includes 10 artists from diverse international and art backgrounds who are new to calling Victoria home. It opens on January 13th and goes on until March 3rd. Um, we have 10 artists in this group exhibition. In addition, we have a number of community satellite galleries around town, including the Victoria International Airport and five Greater Victoria Public Libraries. Please visit our website to learn more about that. And without further ado, <laughs> please welcome our speaker today, John G. Bome. John G. Bome is a distinguished artist and educator with a remarkable body of work recognized by peers worldwide. Over the past three decades, he's built an extensive exhibition history, showcasing his art regionally, nationally, and internationally. His works have been featured in a diverse array of events, screenings, exhibitions, biennales, festivals, and residencies across the globe, spanning countries such as Canada, the United States, Argentina, Australia, Belarus, Belgium, Chile, Czech, China, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Mexico, Netherlands, Northern Ireland, Poland, Romania, Spain, Serbia, Scotland, Singapore, the UK, and Wales. He has also been a shortlisted regional contender for the Soviet Award and has received grants from numerous esteemed international and Canadian institutions, including the BC Arts Council, various branches of the Canada Council of the Arts and the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, DFAIT. Here's what John has to say. 
Um, what interests me is the ongoing reformation of a set of critical interests. These interests draw from my observations of Western society's less considered compulsions. I explore language and paralanguage, that is, both the spoken and gestural aspects of human communication. The performance of gender, specifically masculinity, valorization of labor, the pursuit of leisure, and marshalling emity are areas of investigation. Live artwork presents a direct relationship with material, action, and process, and human interaction as I understand it. Physical involvement is the most embodied way in which to create meaning. Through durational works, the artist and the audience gain access to the unique experience through such commitment. The archetypical, archetypal modality of performance art, an experience that unfolds over a non-extended time. An extended time. No, nothing can replace that learning, that specific duration of being. Although there is no alternative to the durational aspect of performance, I remain interested in the question of the representation of performance. The clear and obvious problem is making the ephemeral available to a larger audience at a different time. Using video to reconstruct an event makes publication and discourse possible. Despite its material concerns, believing art is ultimately rendered in the social domain. So please put your hands together for John. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out on this Friday evening during the holiday seasons. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the Arts Council for the many, many decades of service to the community. And I'm um, uh, grateful to be here uh, right now to share with you on pain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John G. Bowman, and there was three John Bowmans. That's why I have the G in there. It's not with pretension because there's John T, and there's my dad, John L. Uh, and then me, John G. That's why I have John G. Beaumet, in case you're wondering why I put G in there, you know, not to confuse that. Uh, uh, I was uh, born in the Kumeyaay territories of what now is uh, Colonia known as La Jolla, California. Uh, and I um, found my mother dead when I was 13 uh, and sent away to boarding schools, uh, various ones uh, being three boarding schools throughout California. Uh, and eventually graduating from Army Navy Academy. And this image right here was on the cover of the uh, uh, San Diego Tribune uh, of me. That's me right there surfing at Winnensee Beach, about to run over these two people. And, and uh, that was kind of the community I grew up in, was kind of an aggressive uh, community uh, as a cisgender white male of 60 years of age, of German-Scottish derivation. Uh, history. And uh, and the reason I put this slide up originally was because it shows the direct sort of correlation between physicality, uh, aggression, and uh, and the body through surfing, uh, which I grew up with my entire life, uh, and swimming and being in the ocean. Uh, early practice, which has already been said, this one right here, uh, I don't need to go over that again, just so you could... Yes, Performance, gender, valorization of the user. Thank you very much for reading that for me. So he can keep going ahead. <laughs> appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody that's uh, participating in and here uh, on um, relationship between material action process and human interaction. And that, I mean, that's clear as what we have right here. There's nothing that can replace the moment we have in time. And in case you didn't know, I'm not scripted. <laughs> this isn't like I've memorized anything, and the moment we have here cannot be replicated. There's no way that that we could actually replicate this, and if not, it would be uh, simulacra. It would be a pastiche of what is. The reason I, this was a uh, graduate piece, this is on leisure, and this is uh, sort of summarizing, I guess, this idea of leisure activities and the physicality of pain that comes along with that and the pain inflicted uh, through various means, namely on myself, but on the audience that's there as well. And this particular piece involves a number of things. And uh, you can see the correlation from this surfing environment. This is sex wax, tropical scented surf wax, uh, and uh, uh, imitation grass, otherwise known as? Sure. Uh, Astro Turk, which is a trademark name, by the way. 
uh, AstroTurf, and uh, if you go to the next one, uh, I was thinking of leisure activities and I line trim that with just like a room like this with a gas line trimmer with no guard with 25 people in the room and then put it up in in the room. So not only the, the pain inflicted on myself with waxing the floor, but also inflicting on others. And that's part of what we do in the world and something that ethically, you know, you need to be aware of the fact that um, what we do is not, is also the witness, the person that witnesses something and cannot forget that information. Uh, and it comes back to you as you live. Like when you find an event or experience an event that's with you for a light, depending on what it is. And some of these can be uh, mentally, but also physically as we move on. Uh, and uh, this artist working, working artist is another physical event, which highlighted um, this. Is, has, there, has anybody been to the Moss Street painted? I don't remember that one. <laughs> in what, 1998? Uh, and that's a 10 foot uh, handle with a nine foot broom constructed at Dockyard, brooming and, and sweeping the streets and the labor, the, the physical pain or labor that's construed with sweeping the street with a giant broom and the work that's involved with that, uh, as well as the idea of the artist working on the daily job. Like if you were your local sandwich artist <laughs> uh, every day, this was a, another way to look at that. At the time I was working at Dockyard with my friend Jeff who was here uh, as uh, a marine industrial laborers called sweepers, basically. So I was um, doing a master's degree and I was sweeping the streets, sweeping at Dockyard as well. Uh, and as we move on with this, that of course went on to be collected by the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria and uh, it's in their collection, A Giant Broom, which is in, and also in France. So uh, at the same time I was doing the master's, I was exploring the idea of, of which is really a real stretch, when it comes to pain. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I, I pointed this in there is anything, and one of the things that my artist did was duration. Merely by sitting in that chair that you're sitting in right now. Although you feel comfortable now, in four hours from now, sitting in that chair without moving, you're not gonna be comfortable. You're gonna be, you know, it's going to be torture to you, basically. Uh, and not unlike this situation where I golfed for four hours and 600 golf balls in a gallery in Cardiff, Wales at Trace Gallery. Uh, and it had the indexical trace of this with a uh, uh, 26 gauge reflective aluminum and 600 golf balls with a microphone of, of hitting the balls and 100 people in the space, small space, half the size of this room, 600 golf balls, uh, where I golfed uh, for four hours with 600 golf balls. Uh, there was a lot of pain inflicted uh, to me physically hitting a ball from here to there for four hours. Uh, also the irony of having the chiffon pants with the golf shirt, the foot joy glove and shoes, but also audio. There was sound, a microphone on the tee, and there was a PZM, a contact microphone behind the aluminum uh, that, that then projected that throughout the room of hitting the balls against that surface. Uh, and during this, people would come into the space over four hours. And, you know, I'm not a golfer. At the time here, I was not a golfer. It's the first time I'd ever done this. I don't rehearse. This isn't something that I've tried out. I didn't like golfing. There was, it, it, I felt it abhorrent. And that was part of the idea of the reflective aluminum. It was, re it was projecting onto yourself as this fetishized activity. And uh, and that's a concrete wall built in the 17th century and balls would reflect off and break the windows on the other side. And people would come in and two people were sent to the hospital because the ball hit them after, after this performance. And it's not really funny, uh, uh, but it's, it's highlighting the detriment that golf and golfing environments have on the environment and on people uh, that have been um, 
moved because of golf courses. Uh, and uh, I think there, there might be a video. Was there? And this is in the Nanaimo Art Gallery of, in the Nanaimo. And that one I put speakers out over the city. Um, and this is the indexical. This is the four with 600 golf balls. And uh, this is in Cardiff, Wales. And this is, this is after the violence and aggression involved with that presumably rarefied activity. Understanding that, you know, I'm a, a white 60 year old privileged male and understanding where that comes in and, and trying to have a critical look at that history and inherent problems with that and inherent biases and privilege and a whole variety of things uh, and irony and fun as well. <laughs> but how that comes in with pain is that irony. You know, maybe this will work. I don't know what it is. Is it a video? And here it is. This is an Art Gallery. And you can see this. And you can see the violence inflicted on that like a bruised piece of meat. That, or I could keep going on uh, with that. The artifact. Well, that one, uh, that particular piece, uh, Greg Ball, I think, was the chair of the department there, and I think he took a piece of it. Another piece is at Andre Stead, a faculty at, uh, in Cardiff, Wales, at the University of Cardiff. And one other iteration of this was in Los Angeles, and that's in the collection of Jamie McMurray. And another one was in Saskatchewan uh, at in Saskatoon, uh, and that I have no idea. So along with that thing, and and sort of the irony going through the whole thing is this, you know, as I look back at this work, this particular piece was done in uh, San Diego, Chile, and um, and the irony. Okay, so it came from Jennifer Aniston. Anybody know Jennifer? Friends? <laughs> I, I read an article that said my most leisure activity was getting a Brazilian wax. <laughs> Going in for school, and I, I was saying, well, what's that? And I was invited to go down to South America to do a series of work in, in, uh, in Argentina and Chile. And I was thinking, well, what's the history of this area? And the Brazilian wax came up, and I said, well, um, Jennifer Aniston was in wax pain uh, at you know and I, I was waxed before and you know it's uh, and this is a multi million dollar gallery called Animal Gallery the night at the oh, gallery so I said I'm going to come down and I'd like to have an esthetician to come and and perform this on the second floor of the gallery and uh, I'd never had anything like this done before so I had a manicure pedicure facial and a full Brazilian wax on the floor during the night of the museums. And you can see this online. We don't have to actually watch it, but <laughs> it's quite long in case anybody's ever done this. So this idea of this, you know, I can't deny who I am uh, and this privilege that I have and how do we make a critique of, of that by, by going over the top. And a number of these works go well over the top uh, of, of leisure or leisure, depending on where you're from. And uh, with this particular work, and this was done in 19, in 2004 or five, uh, you know, uh, and the idea of this pain and the fact that you can derive uh, such an ironic pleasure out of having your butthole waxed and all the hair pulled off of it. Uh, I found it and you know under your testicles and your crotch <laughs> and and how people can derive some sort of uh pleasure out of that out of this which is basically excruciating pain. <laughs> uh yeah you know what I'm talking about then. Oh well <laughs> I was just, I noticed in your video, it said that the, the, the department's porn up there, 
Could have been yes. paid for your wife. That was that was one of the last pro, uh, promo yeah. art uh, grants that I received to go down to uh, one of the early performances in well, I, I mean, in the area which has a long history of performance, right. Argentina and uh, Chile. Uh, so they supported me okay. to go down and get a manicure, pedicure, facial, full wow. Brazilian wax <laughs> at the Animal Gallery in Santiago, Chile, with two uh, trained aestheticians. That's great. So, yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and now we're finished. <laughs> so the idea, this, this, well, basically when it comes to this topic of fame, because the topic came from somewhere that's very, very overwroughtly uh, in Ukraine, is dealing with horrific uh, violence, as you know, in Ukraine now. And, you know, I feel kind of unsightly or unseemly talking about me getting a manicure, pedicure, facial in Santiago, Chile, while this is going on there. And one of the ideas, having gone to military school and you know, been witness to numerous things, is this irony that happens between a global power and how you can achieve uh, a parity between the idea of leisure and pain uh, and a physical pain at this. This is a physical pain. And when Jennifer Aniston can say, the most you know, a uh, relaxing thing I can get is a Brazilian wax. You know, seriously, really? <laughs> How could that happen? And the privilege that goes along with that. And I thought, well, well, well Jennifer Aniston could do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, uh, other than the tableau that's happening. So I guess we can move on from this. And feel free, <laughs> I think this is still available on YouTube, but it might have been taken off. Um, and this this followed with another work of this idea of leisure, which is uh, leisure, but it sounds more important when you say leisure, uh, uh, is this idea of sport and the irony of sport co-opting various like golf, uh, areas that were used for housing, for farming, uh, for real functional things in the world, and instead sport, golf. In, for instance, and other things, go in and co-op that land uh, for the uh, privileged few. Uh, and this is something kind of like that, but not really, uh, and how we can have labor, leisure going together, but also the idea of pain, because this piece was in Berlin, and I had, uh, I was served 10 Mai Tais while I had a gallon of sunscreen uh, on in Berlin while I played horseshoe and was fed Mai Tais. <laughs> While it was 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside, and I had two sun lamps on either side of me for an hour. So really going over the top with this idea of leisure and the, the pain involved for some people, because people served me Mai Tais <laughs> all night and what we do, because obviously I was sunburned. It was sunny outside and I had two sun lamps. Uh, and the extremes that people go for that. Also, having grown up in Winnensee, uh, I always thought of German people <laughs> always come to the beach with, with G-strings on. So I had a G-string on, thinking of Germany, and, and of course, stereotypes, basically. Uh, and, and coming from a place of stereotypes uh, and archetypes and other things, I thought I'd highlight that, uh, you know, because I really can't deny really who I am. And I use that as an ironic tool oftentimes. And of course, right after I was there, and no, this is in, I did something else in France. This is um, Canaan Christelle Dancer, which by the way, I still have scars. Uh, and this particular work um, uh, uh, used an untrained Chihuahua called Weenie. And I believe that was the name of uh, a Chihuahua owned by Britney Spears. Her, her chihuahua was called We. And this is, uh, uh, and if there was audio, you could hear this untrained chihuahua. And that was uh, yeah. Canine Freestyle Dancing. How do you think it fits into the conservative foreign policy platform? Canine Freestyle Dancing, do you see a place for it? Uh, what's can? What is it? It's a, it's a world's federation that is bringing together dogs and humans in the form of dance. And I just wondering if you knew if there's a place for it in the conservative foreign policy platform. 
Can you uh, elaborate more on what you guys do? Would you like, would you care to elaborate, John? Well, I beg your pardon? This is John. Yeah. Hi, how you John. doing? Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Okay, so I'm doing some World Canine Freestyle Dancing here as, a, as a, an artwork here. We're trying to... It's an internationally sanctioned event here, and here's a number of the guards and a, and a ring, various costumes. And they do freestyle dancing all over the world. It's really a global phenomenon. That's why we're wondering if there's a spot for it in the conservative foreign policy, do you think? Sure, there's a spot for everything. Everything? Spot for everything. Oh, right, man. What was your name again? Daniel. Daniel. Jason, you're asking, you might be asking, I mean, I would be asking, so how does this have to do with pain? Really, it's it's a rarefied idea of a sport called K9 Freestyle Dancing, with it, which is an internationally sanctioned event. Uh, they were thinking about putting it in the Olympics with humans dancing with dogs, which, you know, on the face of it, you think, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> really, seriously. Uh, and so what I did was I thought, well, I'm going to try doing it. I was invited to uh, spend in Toronto, and I'm going to get custom-made dog outfits for an untrained chihuahua. <laughs> And I'm going to highlight the absurdity of the world we live in when people are unhoused and all of these other things. And then people are spending lots of money. There are judges that are paid to go and watch this. And in an event, uh, you know, the quote unquote art event. And one would think that that's kind of, but the fact of the matter is, I have scars from this untrained chihuahua. <laughs> and the thing was biting me all the way on the plane, all the way back. And Okay, that seems like a like, oh well, oh sorry you. But the fact of the matter is people come and participate in these events in the world. And the ironic nature of that in a context of an outdoor market where you don't know what's gonna happen, because the the people witnessing this <laughs> have no idea that it's art. And how do you change their idea to think what has the world come to? when this is an actual event. And maybe it's gone too far. Maybe that'll happen, I don't know, but, and that was that piece, and that's why that's gangster rap, that's five different types of dance, all different costumes, gangster rap, uh, Mexican hat dance, Chinese hat dance, and did I train in any of those? No, I did not. No, I had no idea. They were all just my ideas of what they could be slow dancing. There's Chinese uh, dancing with the, the dog. And these all could be yours because I made custom outfits and mannequins, uh, dog mannequins that they can now live on. Uh, and that was K9 freestyle dancing. And if you want, I can show you the scars later on. Uh, I've got them on here. And that was a, and there it is right there. Here are they, here they are. And there's gangster rap and that's a ring that you can have on your hands. But one would think that this is a pretty innocuous, ironic uh, action, uh, but in fact, it was quite trying uh, really. And there was like potentially probably had, it should have had stitches uh, on some of those with the videos and how to dance with your dog. Um, and the more I look at these, the more I think this is, that's kind of a rarefied idea. Pain. It's kind of a pain of the world we live in here in Western society. And it made me think of, I'm really happy we've gotten rid of that dog. There it is right there. Um, <laughs> and this was right after I was working with a pig in France and never worked with pigs. I mean, it is awful. I don't know <laughs> if I have that, but it, I did a, a rodeo with a pig in France. Awful. Awful experience. <laughs> and this particular Biennale, and I was just talking about this earlier with the uh, uh, lights, and this was uh, once again an ironic, significant event. Right after I left Chile, I went to Belfast, Northern Ireland. I don't know if you're familiar with the troubles in Belfast uh, between the Irish and the Cat, uh, yeah, the Catholic, you know, Irish and Catholic. So it's 32 counties in Ireland. And for this particular work in the awesome uh, um, Hangton, um, tracksuit. I had uh, it doesn't come out with green and orange Catholic and um, and that's 32 counties, 32 shots of uh, Bushmills and Jameson 
uh, with a, an indigenous game called Hurley or Shinti. Uh, it's a Celtic game with a stick called the Shinti or Hurley stick uh, and a slither. And I had slithers there and the objective was to knock out all of the lights. It was during Christmas. Uh, and and just want to let you know that they don't have Christmas lights in Belfast. I had to, I was there for three days. I had to color in by hand all and purchase the Christmas lights by hand. Uh, and uh, Orange is uh, a Catholic, uh, I mean Protestant. And Jameson's is a Catholic whiskey. Bushmills is an Irish, um, is a Protestant whiskey. And so for every Catholic light I brought bro, uh, broke. I drank a Protestant whiskey, uh, commemorating the idea that there would be no uh, division in Ireland. So it was quite a lofty aspiration. So that's 64 shots of whiskey, trying to break out these lights. So the, the anguish of drinking that while breaking out the lights was horrific. There was about 150 people, 200 people in the space uh, at over an hour and 40 minutes. I was trying to, and I'd never played Hurley. I never, I had no idea. I had no idea that the balls were called slithers. It's They're called slithers, and that's why we have slitherins. That's what the, it's a baseball, except the threads are on the outside. Same size as baseball, slither, slitherin, and and that's where the, the Hurley stick or Shinty stick, uh, and Jameson's, and this is the indexical trace of that. But it was really, really taxing when you have an idea as uh, it comes down to the intentionality. So pain comes to how far are you going to go for your idea to come to realization? What are you going to do to realize your idea and to make a point in the world? And to that end, if you have an idea and you're willing to go to whatever extreme it takes, pain is secondary to the realization of your action or your idea. And I had no idea that this was going to take so long because I don't rehearse. The idea of failure is embedded in the work. If the work goes out perfect, then it loses. It's the idea of the moment that we have because, believe it or not, I think failure is part of life. And everybody can understand when something does not work. And there is nothing for me more vital and potent to watch somebody fail and decide what they're going to do. To see somebody go like, it's not working. I wonder what they're going to do. And then pull it out and just persevere with that failure and the pain involved with something like that. I had no idea that when you hit the light out and the whole strand goes out and you drink 12 shots, you hit it again and they all go back on. <laughs> I had no idea that was gonna happen. <laughs> well, that's what happens in Belfast, Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and, and then you go, holy, what am I gonna do? <laughs> you just keep going through because you have an idea that this conflict of the thousands of people that have died for this conflict, maybe this will have, because they're all from Belfast that are in the room, except the artists from other places. And they might understand. And they all came on board and tried to help me out. <laughs> and they came on board and tried to help out. Uh, and that's why the audience was. Um, another, uh, one that had a lot to do with pain and also intentionality was the idea that if you had a full-time job in any major city in North America, full-time, you couldn't afford rent. And there was a whole, amount, we can see them out here, the working poor, uh, the people who live in their cars and have to move their car at 7 a.m. because they're getting a ticket. I was invited to Saw Gallery in Ottawa, along with the International Auto Show to do a work. And I decided to do a work on the do's and don'ts of living in your car. The thousands and thousands of people, we can think of Jim Carrey, we can think of a number of other people who lived in their car. Uh, and uh, the anguish and pain that has to do with that. And so I said, can you give me a car and I'm going to live in the car on the floor of the International Car Show for three days. 
Uh, and they gave me a smart car <laughs> to live in the car. Um, and so I lived in the car for three days on the internet inside the car, show, which is kind of rarefied. But in case you didn't know this, which I didn't know, was in Ottawa, you have to move your car. You can't park it on the street for more than two hours or you get a ticket. And so <clears throat> I didn't know that. But right next to me in the booth that we were in, there was an RCMP. And he happened to have a BFA in visual art, I use the words BFA, he wrote me a ticket. So every every two hours I had to actually push and move the car. <laughs> and then I lived in the car and the, you know, let me tell you, I mean, if you have a job full time and you're living in your car, it's a lot of organization. It's a lot of pain to be able to, you know, come to, you know, you know uh, reasonably dressed and ready to work uh, and live in your car. And you can see them here you know, for sure. And so I thought I'd bring awareness to that. I had brochures and pamphlets and people would come by and ask me. And, and that was uh, the do's and don'ts of living in your car. And, and I mean, obviously it's a North American, it's a North American, I mean, maybe it's global but, uh, phenomenon living in your car. I think people in other countries, um, I can only think, speak of, of this country as well and trying to bring awareness to that and make an artwork that's coaching. Uh, and uh, this particular work, once again, you know, as I look at this slideshow, it's kind of a rarefied slideshow, really. But I was thinking, once again, uh, being who I am as a 60-year-old white male, uh, I was invited to Serbia. And they said, uh, when I arrived in Odici, northern Serbia, at the um, International Multimedia Art Festival, uh, oh, you're going to be doing a performance tomorrow morning in the open market in Northern Serbia. And I thought I was going to do a performance in the gallery and I went, okay, what am I going to do? So I was working with leisure activities and the waste and the, of leisure. So uh, I actually inflated uh, 60 um, inflatable leisure objects in this, I, I was only allocated this square with a Budweiser hat, inflated all of these for four, took two hours to inflate them all with sunscreen and two hours to deflate them. And if anybody is inflated, has anybody inflated an inflatable boat with their own lungs? <laughs> we would think that it's pretty innocuous and pretty, you know, it's gonna, wow. When you do 40 of these, inflating them, that is, that is, you know, you think about, as I said at the outset, sitting in your chair, sitting in your chair for two, three hours is, it's torture, like 40 minutes. But not only inflating them, even equally is deflating them because you can't just squeeze the nipple. You actually have to use a special, has anybody done this? Yeah. <laughs> when you do 40 of them, it is, it's, it's torture. Really. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know that until I did this particular work. That you know, you think it's pretty innocuous. I'm going to do this because I've only got a couple hours to figure it out in this space. And yes, so you remember the original um, this next piece, uh, the Ministry of Casual Living on Holtain Street. Everybody remember that? I was in bio. Well, I, I was thinking about labor leisure, so I had I heated the space up to 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and I washed people's laundry for four hours, people brought laundry in because right across the street, there was a laundromat you could go and use. But this is by hand in a glass crank, uh, the labor of actually washing laundry by, with your hands. Four hours, might've been five hours actually, uh, at the Ministry of Casual and heated up, bringing the laundry in and then hanging it up, going across the street to the laundry room. So that labor, that intensive labor, and that was 2010, 2010. Uh, we can move on because, uh, oh. <laughs> so this particular piece, once again, uh, you know, this ironic idea of sport, leisure, and, and physical pain, and how do you relate that to the people that are really going through and this, I don't know if anybody recalls Guantanamo Bay and the torture that went on uh, Guantanamo Bay. 
uh, to people. And I thought, how do we make this into an artwork, this horrific activity uh, and these rendition camps that are going on around the world? And I thought, rodeo, what a perfect match. And uh, has anybody been to an actual rodeo where you have rodeo games like apple bobbing, pie eating? Yes, like they have, yes. So what I did, I was invited to the Nuit Blanche in Toronto, and what I did is durational pie eating and apple bobbing. So people were zip tied, who were invited in to come, and they were orange bags were placed over them, like in Guantanamo Bay with the orange smocks, and uh, it was presumably you know fun. But then when they realized they've been zip tied with the orange bag over them, and they have to eat this pie, and they have to do apple bobbing, not unlike waterboarding. They realized, I mean, to my understanding from what I've been told, they realized while I was yelling at them in a country suit with a headset on, uh, that something else was happening other than fun. There was actually, they couldn't get out because nobody would untie them. So, you know, at a certain stage, you said, okay, the fun's over now. Let me go. Let me go, is what they said. And they said, no, you have to go apple bobbing now. After that, so there's pie eating. I won't think that's kind of fun, but you realize what's going on in the world now is people are being tortured with the same orange that they're with. And that was followed because that was kind of healthy fun with uh, dirt. And once again, I had a trained esthetician that worked with food as an aesthetic tool. Uh, and then I had on a better rice, manicure, pedicure, facial, but also all edible spa treatments in gold. So this particular piece started at 1130 at night and uh, it was so cold that the oatmeal scrub that I had on my feet and my body along with the gold, edible gold, uh, started uh, wearing off and became freezing. Uh, my organs started shutting down and I couldn't count backwards from 10. Uh, and then at three o'clock in the morning, it had to stop because of the quality of my physical well-being. Uh, but I was willing to go, but they said, no, you can't. When the trained esthetician said, count back from 10, and I couldn't. Uh, so I just stopped, but that was about, once again, a spa treatment, all with edible and the excesses of the world, because these are real treatments. Food is being used for spa treatments. And gold is, edible gold is being ingested and use for various, and it has been for thousands of years, uh, various treatments. And so that was the pain and anguish. This is in, in case you want to know, this is in uh, uh, in Regina or Regina, depending on uh, where you're from. And this is yet another uh, spa treatment. I'll just note, John, we've got 10 minutes to the hour. Oh my goodness! Oh, well, we could. I mean, I. I mean, I could keep going. This belonging network is pretty good, though. Uh, <laughs> eat caring people and you know bloodletting and things like sewing into the body and things like that, uh, which is more direct. But I, it's already been that long. Okay. So we like to leave room for questions. Questions. Okay. You could just whip through these pictures, and then I could field any questions you have. The Western Front. That's at the Toronto Seven A Eleven D. And that's the uh, sewing into the chest some ribbons, putting a shirt on, uh, snipping uh, Madrid, scrubbing, the blood comes out. Uh, well, there's blood letting right there into ceramic materials that if phlebotomists come in. It was great to um, hear about, uh, I believe it was part of the launch where you actually had to stop the performance for safety. Mm -hmm. How often has that happened in your career? Uh, 
I did it. Yeah, that might have been the only only time. Uh, I don't think you know. Never heard with, well, we'll do this. This sorry, sorry, game. Mm -hmm. But this particular piece was the early one where I actually got some results at mile zero. Everybody knows what mile zero is here in Victoria. I'm going to do some results on this hill for four hours. Just going to do some results. It seems pretty naughty with some results. I realized that you can't do some results at least with a bald head because it scrapes all of the skin off the top of your head. Because I didn't realize that I was into it and it just kept peeling it off. <laughs> and then I realized, geez, I got blood everywhere. And I guess that was kind of pain. But I mean, that's what you I guess you'll do. Okay, sorry. Uh, that was the only time and I think that was because there was a trained person there to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't do this. The other ones were like other estheticians, but it was my job was to wax. Uh, and I actually made, you know, when I'm sewing things in the body, I want to make sure that there's, you know, it's not going to hit any major arteries. Do you have um, a big one? Uh, what was it? How deep were you going? It's only a few that deep. No, it doesn't have to be that deep. Right. So it was just in the chest. In other places, stapling in, you just don't want to go too deep. Uh, other things like durational work is much different though when you're working with duration time and I'm pretty driven so I usually go all the way until I really realize that, oh my god I'm bruised all over like a week so I'm into it uh, so that's a different kind of pain uh, yes okay sorry it took so long I didn't yeah with sliding because you know I've been doing work for 30 years so mm -hmm. I have a lot of work and I maybe should have Truncated it a little bit. Maybe I should have truncated it. Randy, what do you think? Uh, okay. I, I mean, we you uh, was that the last slide? Um, no, but I, I <laughs> well, stopped well, here. Yeah, great thing. So. Nope. There's Johnny. <laughs> See. Hi. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'm sorry about that. I'll field questions if you have have any questions. Sorry about taking so long. No, uh, this is right on time. It's not long. Yes. Uh, so thank you, John. When you when you were dancing with the chihuahua, what the voice chose that chose the coyote or the wolf? <laughs> Why did you choose coyote, uh, a chihuahua? Um, well, because it was canine freestyle dancing with it's with a canine. I mean, um, and I thought that was the most appropriate culturally specific work. The coyote in Joseph Boys was representing uh, uh, the U.S. of A. American coyote was the U.S. Uh, which is a wild indigenous animal to the U.S. Day. And the Chihuahua is a wild indigenous, you know, animal for Britney Spears at the time. <laughs> uh, and yes. <laughs> yes. John, yes, sir. Um, there was, you spoke in the beginning about tragedy, boarding school, and surfing, and then you jump to performance. Right. And I'm curious about, the, in between the two, um, seeing performance arts as a career or even getting into it, what, were there any, like, things that encouraged you or things you saw that made that seem like a possibility? Uh, I don't think it's natural that all surfers become performance artists. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the idea I think about was natural. But um, performance art as a area of visual arts is kind of a different segue, I guess. But uh, the idea that I could do something and not have to make something and still have the same impact and not have to carry objects or ship objects or make a thing in a world filled with things. Mm -hmm. and still have people have the memory of an event that could change the way they view the world in a different way mm -hmm. by making a, a committed action. I think that that's what it was in that understanding that, you know, I could do this thing and then it would still manifest in somebody's psyche mm -hmm. if I had the intention. And let me tell you, it doesn't always work out. You know, it, it, that's some pretty lame, not working actions for sure. Uh, and 
you just keep crisp. But I mean, that's what it was driven to me and the idea that, uh, you know, that history could be embedded in the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. and thank you. I think Laura had a question. Oh, yeah. I was just curious about your durational pieces and how you know when to stop. So, which we didn't show in this work is a series of durational works where I clap for 15 minutes or an hour or do other durational works. And usually, uh, the uh, several works I say, this seems like a five minute piece, 10 minute piece. I'll do this for 10 minutes and then turn the lights off and it'll be over. Uh, and then what often happens is they forget to turn the lights off <laughs> and then I just keep going. <laughs> and you go, oh, I'm gonna wait for the lights go off. Or I'd say, you know, dim this to a certain area and then they'll go off. Uh, seems like that seems like enough time. Uh, but generally what happens is somebody will forget to do that and they're so into it they just forget to dim the lights and I'm there for you know 20 minutes doing something and then something else happens. <clears throat> so over a period of time something else occurs. And one of the things which I didn't see in this is that when you see somebody else struggle or somebody else in pain or somebody else and you connect with that and you go I've done that. I felt that way. There's nothing that can change that as a human being in the world in the moment in time. You can watch a video all you want of something, but when somebody is physically in the space going through something and struggling and persevering and going through it, you connect with them. You know, and there's nothing that can replicate that. You can look at an autonomous, autonomous object on the wall and passively look at it and go, okay, that's nice or not nice. But when there's somebody physically in the space with you going through something, and you put yourself there because you're a witness to this, and you, you've signed, you've paid the dough to go in, you've opened the door, you're in, you could either leave or not. But there's nothing that's gonna change that event a moment for you as another human in the space. I wish I should have done that. What the hell just happened? Or WOW, or that was lame. But it's still there in a sense of time. And you know what? Once it's over, it's over. And you're never going to get that back, that moment you had together, if it's real, you know. If there's... That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other questions in the room or Zoom room? Um, if not, I think we can. There's. We might be asleep now. <laughs> Randy's gone to sleep. Um, John, what's next? Uh, what? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked, Kagan. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing a different work in uh, Dortic. Netherlands in May, and then over to uh, do workshops in Prague in the, after that, uh, and the series of work, Prague's year of the rockin' with the performance, and then Mallorca to be part of uh, EPA, and then Essen, Germany, to do work in laundromats. <laughs> Not, and look at, I've already done laundromats. And then over to Cologne to do an open uh, performance, open source performance in Cologne. 